so the recording started uh yeah now it has been started okay and um fine so so shall i start yeah yeah you can start okay Okay. So, so, okay. So just uh, just a minute. So I'll introduce you. Uh, so let us welcome uh, Professor Sri Krishna from IIT Guwahati. So he'll be uh, starting the lecture. So he'll be speaking today on loops as symmetries. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Abhijit Pal. Um, I hope I'm audible to everyone. So uh, please let me know uh, if I have to speak a little loudly or not. Okay. So uh, I will temporarily enable the uh, chat so that I can see if somebody has to type it something. Okay, so um, I request uh, one of the moderator to uh, notice if there is a uh, raise the hand and then please let me know because I'll be concentrating on the a writing part. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. No problem. Thank you. So, uh, in this lecture, uh, we will try to uh, see, you know, starting from the where these groups originated uh, to see various forms of groups and uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to see how, uh, what group presentations are and uh, what are some important classes of groups so all of that you know in just one lecture so treat this more as an um, overview of the objects of interest in geometric group theory um, namely uh, groups okay so uh, first off groups um, historically groups uh, were known as symmetries they you know they um, people knew groups as symmetries of objects um, if we uh, go back to uh, the time of greeks or um, you know uh, way back in the first thousand um, ad so zero to thousand ad etc uh, much of these groups were not really termed as groups but they were known as symmetries of objects so for example uh, we had um, groups of symmetries of geometric objects of geometric objects like um, you know you have all seen the dihedral groups so the the, the um, symmetries of a triangle you know you can flip the triangle about those axes and then uh, you get the other side of the triangle or you can rotate the triangle um, so that this vertex A reaches this vertex B, etc., and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, for the uh, square as well, um, there is a uh, flipping from A to uh, rather rotating from A to B, and then there is flipping about these um, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, etc. So these are some of the symmetries um, of geometric objects, and then you can have three-dimensional objects, the platonic solids, perhaps, and then even there you have uh, groups of uh, symmetries. So then uh, moving forward, uh, groups were then also observed as symmetries of algebraic objects. Um, algebraic objects. So for example, uh, if we look at Galois work, if you have studied some Galois theory or not, um, basically, if you have a field extension k over f, then uh, and then let us say this is not just any extension but a Galois extension. Uh, it's okay if you don't know what uh, Galois extension is. Uh, just you know treat it as some kind of a field extension, special kind of uh, field extension. Then uh, there is a group of all automorphisms. So I'm already saying a group of automorphisms uh, of uh, k such that uh, sigma restricted to f is identity on f. Okay, so uh, when this 
field extension is special. This is called the Galois group of K over F. So what I'm trying to say is that um, groups actually were also observed as symmetries of algebraic objects. Uh, also, if uh, you know when one studies linear algebra, uh, V is a vector space, then the set of all uh, linear isomorphisms, set of all um, isom isomorphisms phi from V to V, um, that is a group. Automatically, it has a group structure by uh, taking compositions. So groups appeared as symmetries of algebraic objects, and then uh, they also appeared as later groups as symmetries of topological objects. So if you have done some uh, covering space uh, theory, you know that if uh, pi from x to y is a covering uh, uh, projection, okay, then you can consider all the uh, homeomorphisms from uh, x to x, the, the covering space x to x itself, which basically preserves the projection such that, so consider such homeos, uh, which preserve the projection. So when you compose with pi, uh, this f, you're uh, still getting the map pi. So uh, a picture is like that. This covers this problem. And then this is pi. This is also pi. Then it preserves the object uh, y like that. So uh, that's a symmetry of the top space x, which basically uh, preserves the base space y. So uh, Abstractly, this can be thought of as the symmetries of X, which preserve uh, the object uh, Y in it. Okay, so these are, uh, this forms a group, a group of X transformations in algebraic topology. This forms a group of uh, X transformations. So, you know, groups have, were obje observed as symmetries of geometric algebraic and topological objects. Now, uh, basically, uh, there are now groups of symmetries. We saw groups as symmetries. Now groups of symmetries, what are these groups of symmetries? So in any category, I, you know, I'll not be technical about defining a category. Although for those who know a little bit of category theory, you can take it to be the mathematical uh, category. Uh, if you don't know what category theory is, or you know you have not looked at the definition, you can just uh, treat it as an English word category. That is fine. So um, automorphisms in any category. Automorphisms are morphisms from the object to itself. So automorphisms in a category automatically form naturally form a group. So this is a um, This is a meta statement, and then you can basically look in the category of sets, for example. And in the category of sets, you take a set X, and then you consider X to X. What are uh, nice enough maps? You can consider all set functions. But a better one is an automorphism in this category will be a bijection. So phi from X to X, a bijection. So you collect the set of all bijections uh, from a set to itself. Okay, set, set of all bijections from set to itself that forms a symmetry group SX uh, is basically all bijections. So this object naturally forms a group under composition. Okay, so uh, here is groups appearing. Um, you know, uh, these are uh, groups of symmetries of the uh, of, a, of a given set. This can be thought of as a group of symmetries of the set. Okay, and in the case of in the uh, category of vector spaces, we already just saw that in the category of vector spaces, um, the odd V is set of all um, set of all linear isomorphisms. Of course, it goes without saying this is the linear category. So uh, linear isomorphisms phi from V. Okay. 
So these automatically form a group, we you know, under um, composition. Okay. So uh, in particular, if you take Rn, the, the vector space Rn over R, and then you study all the uh, maps from Rn to Rn, which are um, isomorphisms, uh, you get the, um, the group uh, GLE. So, in particular, one sees this group GLNR, right? So, uh, in the category of topological spaces, what do we have? What are the um, what are the maps from uh, a topological space to itself, which are automorphisms? So, these are homeomorphisms, right? Self homeomorphisms. Okay. So. Uh, later, uh, in, in some of these lectures, you are going to see um, for special topological spaces, namely for surfaces, you are going to see um, classes of self-homeomorphisms, which themselves form a group. Um, so a quotient group of all self-homeomorphisms of surfaces, which are going to call the mapping class. Okay. So then um, in the topological category, we have these self-homeo and then this is or X, which is a set of all self homeomorphisms of X. So these form a group naturally. Okay. And uh, I'll do one more category, the category of groups itself, the, the set of all automorphisms of a given group. So R G, if G is a group, then R G is the group of um, Group of group of automorphisms of the group itself. Automorphisms of G. So maps phi from G to G, which basically are uh, one to one, onto, and they are homomorphisms. So they form a group. So this is a group of automorphisms also. Okay. So uh, these are groups of symmetries in various categories. So naturally they form a group. So at this point in time, uh, note that history presents us with uh, groups as symmetries. Okay, and then we we are seeing here that uh, groups of symmetries are naturally groups. Okay, and now uh, you know at this point, um, an abstract algebraist would ask, you know, should there necessarily be an object? of which there is you know these symmetries uh, and, and should groups necessarily be seen as symmetries of some object so can't we just define a group in abstraction well that brings us to uh, the abstract groups and um, the axioms of a group so we all know the definition of a group um, as something which is you know when you have a binary operation on a set uh, you know that it is naturally by definition binary operation means it is closed there should be an inverse and then this set should be closed undertaking uh, sorry there should be an identity element and this set should be closed undertaking uh, inverses so then we call such an object as group so the axiomatization of uh, of group um, then happened so so as to release the object and see this group uh, you know in itself so you have a group, uh, an abstract group is something which satisfies uh, these uh, four axioms, that of uh, um, closure and then existence of identity, then uh, inverses and the operation, the group operation itself should be associated. Okay. So uh, such, such an object is group. So uh, here we have definition, I'm not going to write the definition, definition of a group. Okay, and then um, this abstracts all these uh, groups seen earlier. It, it basically collects the crux of that. And then um, one is familiar with uh, subgroups, concepts such as subgroups. One is familiar with normal subgroups and such. So one is also familiar with homomorphisms and um, the kernels of these homomorphisms are naturally, uh, you know, normal subgroups, etc., and uh, normal subgroup correspond to homomorphisms and vice versa. Okay. 
So this, um, I would assume um, everyone is uh, familiar. Okay. So um, now one can ask, okay, so now we, now that we have groups abstracted, just, you know, some set satisfying under, under an operation satisfying those axioms, it's a group. So can we start from the elements itself and form the group, somehow build the group? So the motivation comes from, let's say, linear algebra where, uh, you know, starting from some basis vectors, we are able to capture the whole um, space. So we are able to scale vectors and we are able to add vectors. So only using these operations, um, we are able to capture the whole vector space. So likewise, can we take some elements, some particular uh, elements from the group and uh, create, build the whole group? Okay, so using the axioms of the group, the, the operation of the group. So uh, in this line, so we have the following uh, uh, definition, let G be a group and S is a subset of G. Um, the smallest subgroup. So in the sense of inclusion, the smallest subgroup of G uh, containing S okay, uh, is called the subgroup generated by S. So you take a you know, subset, some, some collection of elements maybe, and then uh, you have this notion of uh, a, a subgroup generated by uh, this set S. So one can ask, well, does there exist such a subgroup? Uh, that's easy to see. We'll denote this by SG. So if you take the intersection of all subgroups of G, such that uh, the subgroup contains, so subgroups of G such that H contains S. Then this collection itself is non-empty because G is naturally there, okay? And then uh, the intersection of all these uh, subgroups is a subgroup and uh, that subgroup uh, serves as the, um, serves the purpose. It is the smallest in the sense of inclusion. So, uh, in the sense of inclusion, which means uh, no other smaller subgroup or you know subgroup which which is contained in this uh, in this particular uh, subgroup uh, will have that that property that it contains S and is a subgroup of G. Okay, so uh, this is the subgroup generated uh, by S. So already we see that um, this subgroup is generated by S means that it is built by the elements of S. So um, likewise, we can say, uh, let G be a group okay, and let S contained in G be a subset such that the group generated by uh, S is actually equal to G. So suppose that this intersection group, the smallest subgroup containing S is uh, G itself, then S is called a generating set. Set for, or a set of generators for. Okay, so um, easy examples include um, the additive group of integers. Okay, is generated by one. It's also generated by, uh, so we'll suppress this uh, group, this G notation whenever it is convenient. So uh, whenever the context is clear, it's also generated by minus one, right? So what is also interesting is that uh, if you consider the set two and three, the set of integers two and three, um, this also generates So uh, Z is generated by two and three, but however, 
two or three uh, do not generate z. Okay. So z is not equal to um, the group generated by two or it's not equal to the group generated by two. So, um, So uh, that's that's basically uh, a generating set for a given group. So one can ask, does every group have a generating set? And the answer is easy. Well, you take the whole of the group, okay, the set, which is the group itself, then um, the group is generated by you. So generators uh, do exist for uh, the whole group. So that's uh, the notion of building uh, elements and uh, building the group uh, from elements. Okay. Then one can uh, one can now ask, you know, like in linear algebra, uh, you just take a bunch of uh, symbols, okay, and then uh, can one just assume an abstract operation which is which acts like a group operation and keep building. You know, however much big group that we can build. Okay, so um, so this sort of generation of a group, generating a group using a bunch of symbols, um, is is called free generation. Okay, and then the resultant group will be a free group. Okay, so um, so suppose I take. Um, as an example, suppose if I take a two element set, or let me start with a, a one element set, A. Um, so assume um, multiplication to be the, so A times A, I'm going to write as A squared, okay? Uh, or uh, the inverse of A needs a notation, so I'll write A bar for its inverse. So then the group generated by A so there is now no uh, context here. The group generated by A, what will it be? You can have A, you can have A squared, A cube, because that's all you can do using the group operation, A power four, et cetera, you keep going. And then there is A inverse. Of course, A times A inverse, I need um, A power zero there. And then uh, A power zero indicates it's A times A inverse. And then I have A bar, A bar squared, A bar cube. So, or in other words, I can write this as a power n such that n belongs to z, where with the understanding that a bar is um, a inverse. So it's it's a inverse is covered. So the group generated by a freely like that uh, is isomorphic. One can easily send a power n to n and see that this is an isomorphism, group isomorphism uh, to z, uh, isomorphic to z. Okay, so this group is isomorphic to z. So one can freely generate. So what about two? So already things get very complicated if we take a two element set and consider some abstract group operation where we just multiply stuff like that. Okay, so A times B is allowed. A times A times B is allowed. A times A times B times B. A inverse is allowed, okay, etc. So corresponding to this set, we need a, uh, couple of inverses because the group should be closed under inversion. So now we take the union of these two. So we have A, B, A inverse, B inverse, okay? And form all such finite length words. So what is the length of this word, for example? Uh, this is a word. So we call it a word because, yeah, it's in the alphabet A, B, A inverse, B inverse. This looks like a word. So we and then what is the length of this word? It is one, two, three, four, five. So five is length. Okay. So we can keep on building all finite length words. So length words of length one, two, three, four, five, etc. Okay. So and then you you can create a large group. So um, now that is not homeomorphic to any of the uh, quote unquote known. Uh, groups. So what I mean by known groups is that uh, classically or all the uh, symmetries of various geometric objects, etc., they all um, they all are classical examples. And um, if I call them as known examples, known examples of groups, none of the uh, this one particularly, you know, it doesn't 
is not isomorphic to any one of them. Okay. So uh, in order to formalize this construction, we uh, do the following uh, definition, which basically does this with any uh, abstract set. Uh, however, the definition will look quite different than uh, you know than this this sort of construction. The proof, however, recaptures all of that. The proof of existence of that object uh, recaptures that. Let us see the definition first. Let S be a set, okay? and then um, a group F containing S uh, is freely generated by S. So we have a group containing the set S. We say that this group is freely generated by S if F has the following universal property. So this is universal in the following sense. What is the universal property? Uh, for every group G and every set map phi from S to G. Okay, so there is a set map, S is a set, right? So there is a set map S to G. There is a unique homomorphism phi bar from F to G, such that the following uh, commutes. Okay, so extending phi, I can say extending phi, i.e. The following diagram commutes S, S is sitting inside F because S is a subset of the group F. And then S, there's a map phi from S to uh, a group G. Okay. And then there's a unique homomorphism uh, here, phi bar, which makes this diagram commute. So you go via S into F, the injection. Okay. And then uh, you come down via the um, homomorphism phi bar that will basically uh, send elements of s uh, into g uh, via the map phi. so uh, there is a unique uh, homomorphism like that so then f is said to be freely generated if this happens for every group and any set map phi then you say that f is freely generated by uh, that particular set x okay so Looking at this definition, one would one would think, you know, why you know why would one make such a definition at all? Okay, why would uh, one come up with uh, an object like that? Or even if such an object exists, so what we are going to do is we are going to uh, see that such an object f actually exists. It is not a mystery uh, that uh, this this f is nothing but you know, like this procedure mentioned here, it is created out of uh, the alphabet. I'm going to call that alphabet um, in the set S. Okay, so uh, so here's theorem. First, uh, uniqueness. So first, I'm going to state that let S be a set. Then. Up to canonical isomorphism, there is at most one okay, or at most one group freely generated. Okay, so uh, the proof is an easy exercise in playing with these uh, games uh, with these uh, you know games with these uh, diagrams so what you do is uh, first assume there are two groups f and f f prime which both satisfy this so uh, you know first use f prime as g then you use f as g and f prime as the group generated by s and um, you compose both those diagrams to get um, you know 
to get that there is a unique object like that. Okay. So maybe we can uh, look at this in a tutorial or you can uh, ask me uh, otherwise. So this, this proof is um, easy and uh, I'm going to skip this proof. So there is only a unique uh, F which will satisfy this particular problem. So uh, existence is, however, uh, this construction that I mentioned. So uh, existence of a free group. So let S be a set. There exists a group F freely generated. So the sketch of proof, I will skip certain details uh, you know, for paucity of time, but um, here is a sketch of the proof. So what you do is um, firstly, let us assume S is uh, non-empty because if S is empty, then uh, you generate nothing but the empty world. So uh, firstly, you consider S hat uh, is the set of all S hat such that S is in this. So what is this? This is a set of formal inverses. So the idea is these are formal inverses to elements in S. So you have already seen the example. We did this A inverse and B inverse in the case of A and B. Okay. So naturally there's a map uh, and then we assume with S intersection has had is empty. So we consider a disjoint set like that. And there's a map uh, which basically takes S into S hat. Okay. And uh, we also say that if you, this hat operator can actually take S hat back into S. So if you apply hat to S hat, we get back S. So these are assumptions on that particular uh, set S hat. Okay, and you define, basically you define these maps like that. So once you have this ready, then what you can do is you can consider S union S hat and consider all finite length of words in this. Okay, so this is indicated by S union S hat star. So all finite length in the alphabet of SCBS, uh, S hat. Okay, so um, like we already saw um, a quick example, if we have a three letter set like that, then a typical word like that, uh, A squared, B cube, C, C hat, B hat cube, B, B hat cube. C, something like that uh, is a, a genuine word, which is an S union S hat star. Okay, so the length of this word um, is 80. Okay, so just add up those two, three, one, one, etc. So now um, of these words, we define a reduced word. So define a reduced word to be a word in S union that star such that, uh, so it's a finite length word, S1, S2, S3, so on and Sn, such that Sj plus one. So the next um, S letter appearing there is not the inverse of the previous letter. Okay. And uh, Sj, is not equal to SG plus one. Okay. So you notice that in the above example, Sri Krishna, there is a question from Gunjit. Yeah. Okay. There's a question. Yeah. Where did elements of S hat come from? Uh, there I defined this particular S hat. Okay. So where are they coming from? They are uh, basically symbols based on um, S itself. So S is an arbitrary set. So S hat is also an arbitrary set. 
so uh, it's basically constructed out of so you are asking where these assets you know these assets belong to what it's a, basically an abstract set uh, which is based on s so, uh, so it's a bunch of symbols, if you. So then you have this um, this particular reduced word. If the consecutive, so you notice that in this example, there is this c c hat. This is not a reduced word because um, the next alphabet is actually the inverse of the previous alphabet. So what one can do with non-reduced words is that take that non-reduced part and cut it down, just clip it down. So CC hat, you replace it with an empty word. Okay. And so uh, you can make the, this word, for example, so I'll continue this example. You can take a non-reduced word and make it a reduced, reduced form. It's word Q. B hat Q, B, A hat Q. So uh, B hat cube and B, so this is also a non-reduced part. You see that um, B hat cube is B hat, B hat, B hat, and then B. So this can also be reduced. So you get uh, B hat squared and then, uh, A hat cube, B cube. C. So that becomes the reduced. So once you have this collection of reduced words, so you consider uh, F is equal to collection of set of all reduced words in S union S Okay, so the empty word is anyway there, which will serve um, as identity. I'm going to say that this F forms a group. Okay, under a certain operation, which I'm going to say in a moment. So empty word epsilon is an F. So uh, there is that empty word. And then you define an operation on F under which it becomes a group. So the operation on F um, that is, which is concatenation of words and reduction. So when you take two words w1 and w2 in f, notice that firstly they are elements of f, so they are reduced words. But what can happen when you concatenate them? So you can you can put one next to the other w1 w2 or in the order w2 w1. Okay, so this is these are different operations. So here w1 w2 is put next to w1. And in this case, W1 is put next to W2. So these are different elements. But when you uh, do this, uh, you, you might have some cancellations at the interface of W1 and W2. So those cancellations essentially arise uh, due to um, alphabets of S and S hat uh, interfacing uh, there at that interface. Okay. So a quick example is if you take S1, S2, uh, and then uh, S2 hat S1. Here is W1, here is W2. When you do W1 concatenated with W2, so uh, you have S1, S2, S2 hat S1. That's not a reduced word, but what you can do is uh, replace it with S1, S1, which is S1 squared. Okay, because this part um, gets reduced. So you have this reduced word. So this operation of concatenation and deduction uh, turns F into a group. So it's easy to uh, show that that turns um, F into a group. Uh, so this operation gives a reduced word because you have reduced it. So reduced word in which So, which is an element of it, which is an S again. Okay. And um, this is a binary operation. So this is, so hence this becomes a, hence a binary operation. Remember a binary operation is F cross F to F itself. Okay. 
okay so uh, this is the binary operation and so uh, so closure is there okay and then epsilon is um, the identity serves as the identity element because it's the empty word so you take s1 squared for example and concatenate it with uh, epsilon uh, and reduce it it is nothing but s1 squared so epsilon serves as the identity uh, and you have inversion so use the uh, these are all finite length words finite length reduced words use the uh, sock and shoe property so inversion uh, so if you have s1 s2 so on until S n. So some possibly with hats, but you know I'm just using um, S one to S n. The inverse of this uh, is basically S n inverse S n minus one inverse or hat. Okay, um, the symbol hat. We are using hat. So okay. So that is the uh, formal inverse of uh, this. And notice that the inverse is also a reduced word because the the original word is a reduced word. Okay. So you can show that if the inverse contains uh, some reduction, the original word should have had that reduction. Okay. So this uh, is inversion, and um, the tougher part is associated. So I will uh, skip the proof of this, but however, it can be shown. Uh, through a little bit of uh, you know index playing, one can show that associativity holds for this operation of concatenation and uh, reduction. So under these, uh, you get a group uh, which is uh, there's a question just now. Okay, so somebody, why is this operational reduced word uh, on reduced word well defined? So what do you mean by well defined? Well defined, yeah. So I have defined it right. No, well defined. Uh, it doesn't have other representatives, right? I mean, why the question does not make sense to me? Yeah. So I have already defined the operation, right? So I'm precisely defining it. Take two words, concatenate them. Uh, no, uh, no ambiguity there. So, and then uh, reduce it. Reduction also, there is no ambiguity. Cancellation of this hats and the uh, uh, formal letters. So I. Yeah, so this is uh, basically a well-defined operation. The representation for reduced word is unique. Okay, so you can say that. Yeah. So you don't get yet another uh, reduced word. That's what you want. You don't get two reduced words. So the operation, um, yeah. So basically the operation of reduction in one direction or the other will not give you uh, two different words. Okay. So one can, one can actually show that with a little bit of patience. So I'm skipping that particular detail. Right? So true. So then uh, this, this forms a group. So I will announce that F is uh, forms a group. And uh, furthermore, um, S it is, and is and it is generated by okay more so uh, like the way we defined it um, this F also satisfies the universal property so let me go back to that uh, definition there uh, so here yeah, the universal um, sorry and universal property here. So it actually satisfies this property that um, if there is any uh, set map from uh, S to any other group G, then uh, this diagram is complete. There's a unique hom homomorphism from this group of reduced words uh, to that particular group such that this diagram completes. Okay, so let's try to show that that's also easy. So um, let let phi from S to H, H is a group, any arbitrary group, okay? Um, this is a map, be a, a set map, okay? Then uh, phi star, basically what you can do is extend that map phi uh, to words in S union S star, okay? To H 
uh, is the is the extended map. How do you extend? If you have you know S one, S two, so on until S n. Okay, that's the word in S union S hat star. So you basically phi star of that is basically phi of S one, phi of S two. That's the extension. So, uh, and then what is going on uh, here is that the that is a group multiplication in H, group multiplication in H. All right. So that that's how you extend phi to uh, words. And uh, notice that phi bar it is easy to construct now. Uh, phi bar of a reduced word. So reduced word is also an element of S N and S hat star. So it's basically phi star restricted to F of the reduced word, of that particular reduced word. Okay. And you can check that uh, this map is a homomorphism. It's easy to check that this map is a homomorphism. I'll give an example rather than checking it previously using uh, you know, a word, etc. So, if uh, W one is once again uh, my favorite S one S two, and uh, W two is um, S two hat uh, S one, these belong to F. Okay. Then uh, your W one dot W two is S one squared that we saw. Okay, so phi star restricted to F of W one times W two. Is basically uh, your phi star of S one squared, which is going to be phi of S one dot phi of S one. So this dot is operation in H, right? Uh, whereas uh, phi star of W one and then uh, times phi star of W two is going to be uh, phi of S one phi of S two hat. Uh, and then times so all this is in H operation in H okay times uh, phi of S two I think that was S two sorry yeah this is S two and uh, this is S two sorry and then this is S two hat times phi of S two so this gives you uh, phi of S one by so phi of S two hat so we will have to uh, map um, so in this extension, this extension, uh, if you map phi of s to some element of h, some h belongs to h. So phi of s hat will be mapped to h equals naturally. Right? So that's the extension. So here uh, you get uh, phi of s to inverse, etc. So you will this will tally with this. Okay. So uh, so sorry. Sorry. Uh, so basically, through example, I'm trying to show that this map um, is a homomorphism. This whatever I have done in the example can be extended for an arbitrary word and show that um, this. This homomorphism, the way it is defined, it is canonical, so um, it is a unique homomorphism. Okay. So uh, th that satisfies the universal property, and hence uh, free groups exist. Okay. So in fact, we have constructed a free group. So this is how we uh, recapture our words and um, you know, the reduced words, etc., and uh, the universal property um, holds. So once you have these free groups, the the uh, the property of these free groups are they are they are freest in the sense that there are no uh, further relations between any two reduced words. Okay, in the sense that uh, yeah, that we are going to say see in a moment. Okay, so next up we have um, generators and uh, relations. What are these uh, generators and relations? So uh, definition, normal generation. So first we have to see what is a normal generation. 
So like we have generated a subgroup uh, using a bunch of uh, elements, we can also generate a normal subgroup using a bunch of elements from a group. Let G be a group and S be a subset. Subset. Uh, the normal subgroup generated by S is the smallest normal subgroup. of G containing S. So a similar definition like uh, subgroup, uh, I mean, group generated by, so this is a normal subgroup generated by S. And this is denoted by uh, SG with a, with a uh, normal subgroup symbol. Okay, and this is uh, not a, I mean, this object exists because once again, you can actually see it constructively. It is basically uh, the intersection of all normal subgroups of G, okay, such that H contains this set S. Uh, this collection is non empty once again because G is in here, okay, non empty. because G is in here. And so you take the intersection that will be the smallest normal subgroup, which contains uh, S. Now, uh, having defined this, we can make the following definition. This is about generators and let S be a set and let R be a subset of S union S hat. So I'm going to call this S inverse instead of S hat because they are uh, formal inverses. So S union S inverse star will be a subset. So I'm taking a collection of uh, these words in here. Okay, so for simplicity, I can um, assume them to be reduced words. Yeah. So. Let, let this be a subset, uh, then let f of s be the free group. We already saw a free group generated by s. Let f of s be the free group uh, generated by the set s. generated by S and quotiented by uh, the normal subgroup generated by R in FS. After all, R is collection of words, okay, reduced words you can assume, and then you can consider the normal subgroup generated by R uh, in FS. So define, you know, we have a notation for that, we'll call this S. So, um, it is a group which is generated by S and we say that uh, R are set of relations that we introduce uh, for these uh, freely generated group. So the quotient group um, is, you know, is called, you know, is said to be generated by S. relations. Okay. So this gadget is actually uh, very helpful. This kind of groups are pretty much, um, you know, just give a generic description of any group. So, um, yeah, so every group, okay, can be presented like this, or every group can be given as a free group. Uh, quotiented by uh, certain relations like that, quotiented by a normal subgroup generated by some uh, relations. So um, that we can uh, do this for every group, it's easy to see. So for example, you can take uh, the whole group as set S, 
every group has bunch of generators i said so you, you take the whole group as s and consider the free group generated by uh, that particular group okay and uh, as a as r as words r you put all the group relations in there what do i mean by group relations uh, so if you have if you remember uh, in a uh, you you constructed kla tables for finite gra graphs so you imagine any you know an infinite kla table if your group is infinite or an uncountable kla table if it is you know uncountable etc so there is a large kla table that you can construct each one of them will have uh, you know some relation so uh, it it will look like x times y is equal to z so, right where times is the group operation and then equality holds in the group so write that as x times y z inverse is equal to identity and then you treat this x times y z inverse as a word so that will go into this r so you consider all such words and then consider the normals of group generated by them. so uh, so if you take g as a group then you can consider f of g g as a set and consider f of g and uh, as r you can take r is set of all relations that hold that hold in g so for example if x times y is equal to z this is how relations are in any group right you multiply two elements you get another element so uh, x times y times it's of it's an associative operation so this is equal to identity in the group g so call that x y z inverse is a relator so it belongs to r r g let me say so you can put r g so this group you can show you guys some more features. Okay, so every group will have such a generator and uh, relation, uh, relator, uh, no, relations kind of, uh, yeah, appearance manifestation. So that's uh, a group. So this basically uh, gives a generic way of seeing a group. Any group now can be. Uh, seen like this bunch of you know, a set and then a relator so notice the advantage of this uh, particular yeah it, yes so maybe one can use this first isomorphism theorem yes put that this group any group is quotient of it true that yes yeah one can use the uh, first isomorphism theorem true so uh, yes that is true so basically because i'm taking the whole kla table or whole relations that exist here and then um, you know i'm taking the free group and quotienting it um, i get g itself so basically uh, i'm using the free property of the um, of the free group so g f g and then i'm using inclusion here and inclusion here okay so that's your uh, and naturally this has to be g fine so uh, what I was uh, going to say is that the advantage of this gadget is that so far, uh, you know, if you look at history or that that first two slides that I presented, um, groups appeared as symmetries of object. So maybe you needed an object on which you know this group acts. So uh, the abstraction of the group has done away with this object. It gives a a, a group as bunch of axioms. Right. So now the question is, can you give me any group? Yes. You know, this is the most general way to give a group. Okay. Using any arbitrary set and any bunch of relations, you can give any group. So that's, that's, that's. however, um, this form of a group um, is most useful when we study, uh, you know, this this particular S R with S is finite. Okay, with when the set S is finite, uh, this is the most uh, this is useful. This gadget is most useful. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we will comment on that uh, later. So uh, 
this SR satisfies the following universal property. Okay. So, so let S be a set uh, and let R be like earlier S union S inverse star. Uh, the group S R together with the canonical map phi from S to F of S quotient with R F of S the normal generation like that which is S R. Uh, has the following property. So what is the canonical map? You just send S to um, singleton um, you know, elements here, well, the, the single words here. Okay. And um, yeah, if they are quotiented, fine, that's okay. So, and then uh, this has the following property uh, for every group G and every map phi from S to G with the property that phi star, we saw this map phi star already, the uh, extension map, phi star of R is equal to E uh, in G for all See, you're quotienting by uh, the normal subgroup generated by R. So you expect that if you take a, a, a group G, in that also the phi star of this map should be such that phi star of all R is identity in G. Okay. So if that happens, um, there exists a there exists a unique okay, homomorphism. Homomorphism phi bar from SR G such that phi bar composed with phi is equal to. So there is that um, SR and then there is this phi and um, here is your S. So this diagram basically comes. There is a unique phi bar such that uh, this set map is given where in this group G all the relations like this hold okay. then you can actually uh, factor it through uh, S by R. Okay. So that's the universal property here um, and um, we will see a quick example. Uh, this is the example once again of dihedral group So these are isometries of Xn. Okay, so let, let me picture a hexagon and then all the isometries here are basically ones which take this hexagon and you know, somehow send this uh, hexagon to itself such that um, you know these vertices go to vertices. So that's the uh, set of isometry. Now this is this has a uh, the following. Uh, so this is called a presentation. So this is called a presentation. Okay. So this group isometries of X n it has the following presentation S t such that s power n. So here are the relations. So this is the set s. Okay. And then here are the relations s power n, t squared, and s t s t inverse is equal to s inverse. So I'll write below, sorry. So this is s t such that um, s power n uh, 
um, sorry, uh, s power n p square p s p inverse. So this, uh, if we denote this group by d n, okay, then this is basically the isometry. So, okay. so here uh, one can actually uh, show this carefully. This this is basically the one which turns um, this vertex to here. The two pi by n turn, two pi by n turn here, uh, which sends this. Uh, object x n to itself, that is your s, send that to s, and then uh, t is basically the flip. You can take any one axis and flip it. Okay, so that is your t. So this flip, you send it to t. So flip is sent to t. You can check that uh, the flip satisfies t squared is identity. It said this s satisfies. 2 pi by n taken n times is identity, etc. And then this relation also holds. Flip turn and flip is equal to the turn inverse. Okay, so that, that can also be checked. So you can easily establish um, this one. Um, so phi bar from dn to this one. So th there is a well-defined homomorphism uh, from here to here by the universal property. So phi bar is well-defined. And this is by universal property. However, um, in the uh, reverse uh, direction, um, you have to construct the map carefully. So psi from isometries of Xn to uh, Dn, you have to, uh, construct the uh, map. So list all the isometries of Xn and try to uh, construct the map, map it to these uh, elements of this uh, set, uh, this group DN. Okay, so that can be done uh, with a little bit of effort. Okay, and so this is uh, the dihedral group, um, this group of symmetries of Xn appearing as uh, generators and relations. So this is a normal group generated by these particular words. Okay. So it is, it is sometimes, so look at the last relator, it is written TST inverse is equal to S inverse. So um, people often do that instead of taking a word, uh, remember that S is a subset of S union S inverse star. Okay, so uh, it should actually appear as a word but what, so this is S, TST inverse S is equal to identity. Um, so in the group, so the word uh, in R is actually TST inverse S, that should be the word. Okay, so it's often uh, convention to write a relator like that as well. Okay, so that is groups using uh, relators and I mean generators and relations. Okay, so in this regard, there are, um, you know, this presents present giving groups as giving groups as SR generators and relations has its own problems. Uh, one of the, you know, these are Dane listed these problems, Max Dane. So uh, some of the problems are as follows. First, um, word problem. Because there are these relations, if I take two words, W1, W2 belong to the free group generated by S. Okay, let me take two words like that belonging to free group generated by S. In G is equal to SR is W1 equal to W2. In particular, if I give an, uh, a word W1 in F of S, okay, um, is W1 equal to identity in G? Okay, so I'll write P in G. So this particular problem um, is called 
So answering this problem uh, is not easy in general, okay? Uh, but there are large classes of groups for which uh, this uh, problem, which is called the word problem, uh, can be answered. Okay, but there are still a lot of classes of groups where uh, you know, this problem needs an answer. Second uh, is the conjugacy problem where W1, W2, once again, you take two words in F of S. Okay. Uh, in G is SR. So given a bunch of relations, uh, there for these generators um, is W1 conjugate to W2. So suppose you are able to answer the word problem, okay, then the next level of the next question will be, are these conjugate? So the conjugacy problem is harder than the uh, word problem, naturally. Okay, so uh, is W1 conjugate to uh, W2? Okay, so this is this is called a conjugacy problem in groups given a particular presentation. And three, there is isomorphism problem, which is the toughest answer. So uh, given G as S R and another G prime is given as S prime R prime. So you, you may even assume this is S R prime or S prime R prime. So is G isomorphic to G prime? So how, you know, in, in increasing order, these problems are um, tougher to answer in, in any uh, collection of groups. So the word problem has been answered um, for many classes of groups. However, it remains open at large. Then there are conjugacy problems in those classes of groups, uh, which are once again answered in some classes of groups. Then there is this isomorphism problem given two presentations. Can you, uh, can you group, go from one group to another? Is, are they isomorphic firstly? So uh, yes, so some techniques, partial techniques exist to answer uh, this isomorphic problem as well. So, however, uh, this is far from complete. Okay, so uh, am I out of time or uh, can I continue for? Yeah, yeah. you can continue for uh, another. I, I'll, I'll not take much uh, time. Uh, I'll just take maybe another five, ten, not more than five. Ten. Yeah, so um, finitely presented groups. So if you have um, a group G is finitely presented, if G is equal to SR, it's given as SR, S is a finite set and R is a finite. So if G is, is, is an abstract group, if it can be written as uh, SR like that, where S is a finite set and R is also a finite set, then you say G is finitely presented. So generally when a finitely, you want to say group is finitely presented, it comes associated with a finite uh, presentation. So as an example, um, if, X is a path connected CW complex. So it's uh, for those who have just seen simplicial complexes and not CW complexes, um, you know, CW complexes are a generalization of simplicial complexes in a, in a manner of speaking. Okay. So if you have a CW complex with a finite two skeleton, so if you have uh, taken algebraic topology at the level of Hatcher, then uh, you would know a CW complex. So if it has a finite two skeleton, okay, then the 
fundamental group. Okay. Oh, 5 1 of x is finitely good. And if you take the converse is also true that if you take a uh, finitely presented group, then uh, you can put it as a fundamental group of a certain uh, finite CW complex of dimension, you know, greater than four, greater than or equal to four. All right. So that's uh, that. And then um, here, that's one example and yeah so there's appearance of the fundamental group here and i will state a fact that there are you might be wondering that if, if every finitely generated group is finitely presented there are finitely generated groups so it's called finite generated group if s is a finite set right we already said that so there are finitely generated groups which are not finitely present. So that's about uh, groups and presentations. And then um, uh, so there is a question. Yes, question. Third day process prime and the. Um, Reactions are the relations are the same. Then G and G prime are uh, isomorphic. Um, so you are giving the same. Uh, only the cardinality is same. Is that right? Uh, so if the cardinal, um, the relations are the same, right? So then the group generated by S and S prime are the same. So naturally they have to be isomorphic. Okay. So yeah. you just write S in the language of S prime. Yes. So that's the answer. And then uh, new groups from old, we can actually create a lot of uh, yeah, new groups from old. In particular, I want to mention um, two techniques. Okay, others I will skip, but one of them is uh, push outs. So uh, here I need a lot of uh, gadgets. First, suppose that there is there are two groups, G1 and G2, which contain um, a, so a common subgroup in the sense that there are um, there are but or if there are homomorphisms alpha one from a to g one and alpha two from a to g two okay, so these are just arbitrary um, homomorphisms from groups okay to uh, to groups and then there are there are yeah so then you can have there is a group G also such that this there are homomorphisms beta one and beta two which make this diagram come out. Okay. So actually there are many groups which actually fit this bill, but G is called a uh, push out. Um, G is uh, called a uh, push out. Um, of G1 and G2 if it satisfies the following universal property. What is the universal property? So not only are there homomorphisms beta 1 and beta 2 such that you know, this diagram commutes, but given any group H, okay, which also makes this uh, outside diagram commute. So here is phi one and phi two. If H is any group such that phi 1 composed with alpha 1 is equal to phi 2 composed with alpha 2, then G 
G is such that there is a unique homomorphism phi. G is such that there is a unique homomorphism phi. Um, phi composed with beta one is equal to phi one, and uh, phi composed with beta two. Then, uh, so if this universal property is satisfied by G, then uh, G is called the push out. So it's sort of the largest group, uh, which basically satisfies, you know, which makes this, in, in a manner of speaking, which makes this diagram commute in such a way that if you bring any other group, which makes this diagram commute, then there is a unique homomorphism from uh, G to H. Okay. So, uh, these pushouts you would have seen uh, appear in ciphered Van Kampen's theorem. So, if you have uh, studied algebraic topology, then you will see that um, you take the fundamental group of two pieces. So, you, you, if you are given a space X, you split it into two pieces, and then each of them you can figure out the fundamental group of them. And then there is the intersection whose fundamental group you can figure out. Uh, then you can actually Calculate the fundamental group of the whole space using the push out. Okay, so um, that's yes. So uh, does push out? Yes, there is existence of uh, um, push out. Okay, so um, once again, when we state this universal property, there is always a question of existence and uniqueness. So yes, the answer is yes, but uh, we'll not have uh, time to prove it. Um, I will just mention two special cases of. Uh, push out. Uh, one, if A is empty, is rather the trivial group, then the push out, uh, then G1, so this push out is written as uh, G1 star. So if you look at this diagram, it's written as G1 star A G2. So uh, this G1 star G2, because it's A is trivial group. So this is, um, this is basically is called the free product. Of G1. Two, um, if alpha one and alpha two are injective, there is no reason. So if you have uh, worked out some fundamental groups, um, we'll do so in tutorial two. Um, so there is no reason these have to be injected. Alpha and alpha two are injected, are both injected. Then uh, this G one star A G two is called the amalgamated product product of G one and G two. That gives an unlimited product. So, um, yeah, so this have to be injective, then you get uh, this push out is an unlimited product, an unlimited free product. And um, so, those are the special cases I wanted to mention. Um, I think um, we'll stop here. So, those gives you more groups which are presented. Okay, so this this group will have a presentation. We'll see in the tutorial um, using Van Kampen's, we can actually get a presentation for G. Okay, so not in the abstract setting of groups, but when these are fundamental groups of uh, topological spaces, we can actually get a presentation for G using presentations for G1 and G2. So in general, a presentation for G exists using the presentations for G1 and G2. So I'm not doing that here. Uh, and I want to mention that all, all or much of this material is coming from um, geometric group theory by Clara Lowe. It's a very uh, well-written book. Uh, that's the author. Okay, and um, if you have any questions, you can ask. Yeah.
if you have any question, please ask. With question, you can ask. So, uh, solving this uh, dense problem, same as giving an algorithm for, for any group. Is it same as an algorithm? Is that your question? Yes. 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 What is the meaning of solving this? So solving is basically yes, algorithmically solved. So, uh, in finite time. Algorithmically solving it in finite. That's the meaning of solving this. Fine. If uh, there are other questions, are there any other questions? I think in Monkris also, this push out kind of thing, it is also there, I guess, right? Mm. In Monkris. Okay. So in the limited setting of, uh, uh, you know, um, trying to see presentations of these pushouts uh, we, uh, of, of topological spaces, we'll uh, see the Seifert van Kampen applied to surfaces in the, in the tutorial. If you have not already seen such a thing, um, we will see that in the tutorial. So we can give presentation of the pushout. Yeah, but nevertheless, it's a new, it's a technique to create new groups from old groups. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if not, um, shall we meet in some time for the tutorial? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so shall we start uh, 11.30 or you want later? 11.30 is... 10 minutes break, okay. Yeah. Okay, so then, uh, so we meet again at uh, eleven thirty. Yes. Yeah. So, survey saw so, sort of if you are here, please stop the recording.